Good morning and welcome to today's devotion. Let us unite together in prayer. Father God, we come before you today and we give you all our praise and adoration, acknowledging you to be the one true God, the sovereign Lord over the entire universe and over all the nations. Father God, before you we are as nothing, mere creatures of dust. But yet, despite our complete insignificance, you, the Almighty One, graciously chooses to have fellowship with us. We give you thanks that despite our sinfulness and our unworthiness, you have not distanced yourself from us, but rather you have drawn close to us. We give you thanks that you have called unto yourself a people Israel, and that the Church is your new Israel. We give you thanks that you spoke to your people Israel in a variety of ways through the lawgivers, through the wise men, through the writers of songs and poems, and of course, through the prophets. We thank you that even in those Old Testament days, they pointed towards the one who was still to come, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would be your final and complete revelation of salvation to a lost and perishing world. And this day we give you thanks for the completed work of Christ upon the cross, that all who have faith in Christ, all who have been regenerated by the power of the Spirit, are indeed assured of salvation and everlasting peace and reconciliation with our Heavenly Father. Father God, we acknowledge, like Israel before us, we have sinned and gone far astray. We acknowledge that we are deserving of your just and righteous anger. But today we rejoice in the knowledge that in Christ there is no condemnation, that we are set free from sin and its power and its deadly effects, and instead enjoy the indescribable bounty of life in Christ. Be with us this day, we pray, and now as we turn to your word, give us listening hearts and receptive minds. For the sake of Christ. Amen. We turn now to the Word of God as we find it recorded for us in the book of Jeremiah. And I'm going to read Jeremiah chapter 1 in its entirety. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests of Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And throughout the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, Sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and he touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see a branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting towards us from the north. The Lord said to me, From the north disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. 
I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods and in worshipping what their hands have made. Get yourselves ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Amen. And we pray God's blessing on the reading of his word. Well, following on from my little series on First Chronicles, I thought we would turn to Jeremiah. And it so happens that Jeremiah is the chronicler's favorite prophet. And he actually derives a lot of his thinking from Jeremiah. Experience has taught me, however, that most people are not deeply familiar with the book of Jeremiah. I think it would be fair to say that the vast majority of Christians today find the length of Jeremiah to be really quite intimidating. The second aspect is that the structure or layout of Jeremiah is far from straightforward and that then confuses people and deters them from studying the book in depth. So what I hope to do over just the next few weeks in these little devotions is to one today give us a little bit of an overview of what Jeremiah is all about, because interestingly chapter 1 gives us a means of interpreting the whole book, and then in subsequent devotions we'll dip into key sections of the book just to give a sense of what it's all about. So let's have a look then at chapter 1. As ever, it's useful to have a Bible handy just to look at the verses as we look at them. And if you look there at verses 1 to 3, you will see the historical context of Jeremiah being set out. Now, I don't want to labor this in any excruciating detail, but basically just to say that one of the most significant and terrible events that ever happened to the people of Israel in the Old Testament period was the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 586 by Nebuchadnezzar. But what made it so especially terrible was the fact that this was a God-ordained judgment, that Nebuchadnezzar was being used by the Lord God of Israel to punish and judge Jerusalem. And Jeremiah's role was to announce that forthcoming judgment upon Jerusalem and Judah. So his ministry took place in the years immediately preceding that terrible, awful event. In verses 4 through to 10, we then see the call of Jeremiah. Just like Moses, just like Isaiah, just like Ezekiel, Jeremiah was called specially by God to be a prophet. And very much like those other prophets, Jeremiah felt very much unequal to the task. But, of course, God knows what he is doing, and he then promises Jeremiah suitable equipping for the task to which he has been called. He puts his hand upon Jeremiah's mouth as an indication that Jeremiah will be speaking the very words of of God. We'll come back to that in our application at the end. Moving on then to uh, verses 11 through to 13, Jeremiah experiences two visions from God. And I want to just go off on a little tangent for a moment to pay some attention here to the first of these visions, where Jeremiah has a vision of an almond branch. And God immediately explains that vision of an almond branch as indicating that God is watching to see that his word is fulfilled. And you might say, what on earth is that about? Well, it's a play on words. 
Now, in Hebrew, the words almond branch sound very much like the words I am watching. And there are quite a few examples of this kind of thing in Jeremiah, where God gives symbols and visions to Jeremiah. And sometimes the modern day reader is a little bit confused by this. But I want to encourage you, don't be intimidated by this because the meaning of the vision is always explained in the text of Jeremiah. So even if it's maybe not immediately clear what it's about, the text always explains to you. Now the second vision that we get here is the main and perhaps the most important vision that really sets the scene for the whole of the rest of the book of Jeremiah. And that is a boiling pot that is about to tip over. It is coming from the north, and when it arrives, it is going to spew forth its contents with devastating consequences. Now, like I say, Jeremiah, as a book, does not wait long before it explains these kind of visions. And so in the next couple of verses, then, the vision is explained. The boiling pot represents a coalition of of foreign nations that God is gathering together to send down as a destructive force upon Jerusalem and Judah as a punishment for their idolatry, as a punishment for their abandonment of the one true God of Israel in favour of idols and other forms of law-breaking. And when that punishment comes down upon them, it will be absolutely and utterly devastating. Most of the remainder of the book of Jeremiah is devoted to either anticipating prophetically what that destruction is going to be like, or describing why it has come about. It then describes how it came about, and it then describes the aftermath of that destruction. So to be quite frank, Jeremiah very often is dealing with very difficult, dark themes. Sometimes the modern readership find the negative tone of Jeremiah too much to bear. But this is really a bit of a caricature of Jeremiah because indeed wrapped up in the rest of the book is also the story of God's redemptive plans, not only for Jerusalem and Judah, but indeed for the whole of the world. Jeremiah chapter 1 then finishes in the last three verses with a warning and an encouragement to the prophet Jeremiah himself. And what the Lord is saying to him here is that the message that he has to proclaim to Jerusalem and to Judah is not going to be well received. In fact, he is going to be hated for the message that he is going to proclaim. He will be hated by the king. He will be hated by the civil service and all the top officials. He will be hated by the entire religious establishment of both prophets and priests. And he will be hated by the people. He is going to be an object of ridicule and scorn. He will be denounced as a fool, a maniac, and a traitor, a foreign spy. And indeed, ultimately, he is going to be plotted against. Some will seek to imprison him. Others will seek to assassinate him. And what the Lord God of Israel is saying here to Jeremiah is that he cannot bend or bow to any of this pressure. He has to stand like a bronze wall. He has to stand like an iron pillar, unyielding in the face of of all this pressure, of all this hatred, of all this opposition. And indeed, as we read the book of Jeremiah, we see that he did just that. Although there were many times where Jeremiah himself wept with the anguish of having to fulfill this difficult mission, he stood firm because he was standing in the strength of God. Now, that's a little summary of chapter 1. It's also, in many ways, a summary of the whole book. But let's think of some points of application for ourselves before we conclude our devotion today. The first thing that strikes me about this passage is the call of Jeremiah and the fact that God had plans for Jeremiah even as he was being knit together in the womb. Now, I think it would be fair to say that very few of us are called 
to the kind of ministry that Jeremiah is called to. But all of us are called, in one way or another, to Christian service. Now, I don't mean by that that we're all called into ordained ministry or that we're all called into overseas mission service or something like that. That would be patently nonsensical. But all of us are called to serve God by loving God with all our hearts and our neighbour as ourself. In addition to that, it would be fair to say that we have not all been given the very special giftings that Jeremiah was given when God put his hand upon Jeremiah's mouth. But it is also true to say that the New Testament tells us that all of us have gifts and skills which God has given to us that can be used then in order that we can fulfill that calling to love God with all our heart and our neighbour as ourself. It's all too easy for us to say, oh, I'm not called or I'm not gifted and give ourselves an excuse from active participation in the life and witness of the church. But we do well to remember the Apostle Paul's analogy that we are all members of the same body and the body needs all its different parts and all the different parts of the body of Christ, the church, are needed for that life of effective witness to the gospel. The second application I want to draw out here is that we note that Jeremiah's call was not an easy one. In fact, it was a very difficult call and God warns him just how much opposition he should expect to receive. And we as modern-day Christians have often forgotten that we too should expect to receive opposition from the world. Woe to us if all men speak well of us. There is a lamentable tendency in much of the Western church these days to talk about us as Christians thriving and blooming and flourishing and living our best lives, but yet there is very, very little talk about us being a prophetic voice in society, speaking out against the idolatry and the false teaching and the moral filth that is so pervasive in modern society. So I leave you with this rather unsettling thought that our calling as Christians, as we serve God and our neighbour, is not to have that easy, quiet, comfortable life that so many people seem to yearn for, but rather our calling is to be that bronze wall, that iron pillar that stands for the truth of the gospel, irrespective of the opposition that comes our way. Amen. Let's unite together in prayer. Father God, we pray for others now. In particular, we pray for those who have difficult callings in life. We think of those that you have called into ministry and missionary situations where they face persecution. We pray, Lord God, that in your mercy, you would deliver them from that persecution as they proclaim your truth. Father, we pray for all of us. We ask that all of us would take our calling to serve the Lord and our neighbour seriously each and every day, that we would never shrink from that calling, and especially that we would never shrink from that calling in the face of the opposition of society around us. Keep us true to your word and make us brave in proclaiming Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit Be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.